So this is Station Fall. The basic idea of the game is that there is a space station. It's like a, a corporate space station where there's lots of evil science going on. And so the idea is that one of these characters you are going to pick to be. So you're going to be dealt two identity cards and you're going to choose one of them to be as your person. And who you choose will determine what your victory conditions are. So um, if you look on the bottom left of any one of these cards, you'll see victory conditions, and uh, that's what you care about. If you're the corpsicle, then you care about uh, getting the miracle cure. So you want to survive, so you're, you're uh, uh, an old guy or something, you're trying to get off the station, you want to survive, and you want the bio samples to survive too, so that the company can maybe give you a chance to, uh, at uh, immortality or something. Uh, the border, if the border is a player, then they're going to be a pirate and they're going to care about getting the money or the artifact and getting bribed and stuff like that. So um, there's lots of characters on board. Some of those characters will be players, but you won't know who's who, um, certainly at the beginning of the game. Now, over the course of the game, you may decide to reveal yourself and if you reveal yourself by playing your secret identity face up in front of you, which is the first decision you make when it's your turn, by the way, you will gain whatever special ability is in the bottom right of the card. So the conspiracy power on the bottom right. So for the border, again, that's fire support and pickup. Um, for the commander, you get forceful presence. But you, what's important to remember is that those characters do not have those abilities until and unless they are revealed to be a player. Does that make sense so far, I'm hoping? All right, not hearing any objections. The, um, the conspiracy powers only exist after you revealed. So players will be making decisions as to whether they want to play it sneaky or whether they want to, when, when is the right time to reveal their identity to gain their ability, if at all. Uh, gain their special ability, if at all. Now, each of the characters also has just regular abilities, which are these colored things on the top of their cards. Those abilities are active um, all the time, basically. So the the digital assistant has those abilities regardless of whether the digital assistant is a player or not. The astro chimp has tunnel rat and is loyal, regardless of whether they're a player or not. So um, those are the abilities and sort of mm, mechanisms, perhaps, that players will be using to accomplish their tasks on the map. Okay, I'm going to be setting up Station Fall in the TTS mod as it currently uh, exists. We're going to be tracking the rules um, and going through the steps to, to set the game up. You'll notice that uh, the map is here, and that the, in the TTS mod, the characters actually start in their respective locations on the map, but that's going to be every character in the game. In a particular playthrough of Station Fall, you're only going to have a certain number of major characters, and you're going to first be randomizing this deck of major characters, which is here, and you're going to be drawing the correct number based on the number of players uh, in your particular playthrough. For this, uh, we'll set up a uh, four-player game, which according to the rules, is the 13 major characters at this point. So I'm going to draw 13 major characters and place them into generally uh, three columns. Okay, and then we'll flip all these at the same time to see what they are. And so these characters are the ones that are actually going to be in uh, our playthrough of the game. So the next step in the rules is going to be to locate the characters that are on this map that are not in play and remove those characters. So I can see, for example, the daredevil here in the locker room is in fact in play. Uh, so she is good to go. I see the botanist is in play. Looks like the clones are not in play. So they're not major characters. So I'm going to go find all the clones and I'm going to remove them. Now the stowaway is kind of a special uh, exception. The stowaway starts actually off the map. So we can just place the stowaway marker on the stowaway card over here. It has special rules associated with its setup. Um, but that's still something that you should pay attention to to try to make a determination. I'll also call out a particular character here, the, 
the corpsicle is actually white on the back of the card because the corpsicle starts downed. So that's one to keep an eye out for. The corpsicle is in our game, so the corpsicle will be uh, there on the map. So, if we did this correctly, we should be able to count up the characters here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 for the stowaway, um, and we're good to go. Now, um, the next step is going to be uh, finding the identity cards associated with these particular characters. And they're organized pretty much alphabetically up here going top to bottom in these rows and you're going to want to take all the items associated with it um, uh, all at once so that means if we start here with the stowaway i'll go to the s's i'll look for stowaway and any counters that are next to the stowaway are going to become part of our game here so one of them is going to be the copper mat and this is the copper mat associated with the stowaway which makes sense and you'll see this brown bag here is the copper mat uh for, or the bag for all this, the compromat in the game. So I'm just going to drag the compromat, put it there. And I'm also going to grab the identity cards. So this, these are the identity cards, right? So these down here are the character cards. These are the identity cards. So we have to make an identity deck that's going to match and, ex and include only the major characters in the game. So we're going to find the stowaway, and we're going to start to make a new identity deck up here. So you accomplish the stowaway. Then we go to the digital assistant, so which is probably listed under the computer section here. We'll throw the compromat here, but now you'll notice there's two other tokens. Uh, we can grab the identity and put it in the identity deck. There's two other tokens. So some of the major characters actually modify the map or the game in some way, um, and the digital assistant does that. And if you want to know where to put these things, um, that can be kind of tricky, but what you're going to look for is a dashed box that includes um, the term of the particular character, the name of the character. So this is the digital assistant. So this one's gonna go here. This is an additional system action is in the game because the digital assistant's in the game. And there's a second one here, which is as an action character or hacker can manufacture the digital assistant. So um, those are two uh, boxes where you'll place those two, different, uh, those two different items. And now we are done with the digital assistant. We're gonna move on to the rat. Rat's fairly easy. Telepathic rats down here. We grab the compromat. We grab the identity card. And we're done with that. Then we go to the corpsicle. And the corpsicle uh, is here. We got a compromat. We're going to throw in the bag. Now, any character that starts with an item, the item is going to be up here next to the uh, next to the identity card. The item, obviously, is not going to go into the identity deck. So we'll take the item and we'll just go ahead and give it to the particular character. And then we'll take the identity card and throw it in the bin. All right, now the doctor is kind of strange. Uh, the doctor has two identity cards associated with him, uh, Jekyll and Hyde, but only one compromat. We'll take that compromat, we'll throw it in the bag. We'll take both of these identity cards. Then we go to the inspector, and the inspector is here under I. We've got a compromat, we've got an identity card. And then we also have another modification to the map. In this particular case, the inspector's ship. Now the inspector, you can see the little dash box actually goes over this escape pod. So we're actually going to put the ship there, um, parked in a spot instead of an escape pod. And then this little box just explains the rules for it. Now when the game is actually published, we're going to condense a lot of these things. So there won't be two separate markers and the rules for these sections will be included in the sections. But as the, car as the art currently exists, if you want to know the special rules for a section, you'll need to be able to uh, look for um, the appropriate colored box that will explain it. In this particular case, if you want to know how to launch an OSHA ship, then you're going to need to look at this little box. Go find the Daredevil here. Compromat goes in the Compromat bag. Identity card goes in the Identity stack. And the dive suit is just an item. And uh, if you look here, you can see the little Daredevil thing and stuff like that in there. Okay, so right now we have a stack of identity cards. 14 identity cards. There's 13 major characters. Each have one, except for the Doctor has two. So that's why uh, we have 14 cards in this particular deck. I'll also mention that the drones up here is kind of a special card as well. The drones do not have an identity card, which is why this card starts locked and there's an X over there to help you remi remember. 
um, the drones uh, will not contribute an identity card to the deck if the drones are in the game. Um, so we have a bag full of 13 Compromat matching our major characters, and we have 14 identity cards matching our major characters. So uh, the next thing we'll do uh, per the rules is we'll take this bag of Compromat, we're going to randomize it with the R key, and then we're going to just start placing them over all of the orange Ks on the map. So if you just look around, it should be pretty much visible, and we're going to place it to try to cover all the orange Ks. And the orange Ks you can see uh, described here are just where Compromat starts in the game. So we don't know what's uh, which Compromat is where, but you do know that there's going to be Compromat in those locations. Looks like there's two in Escape Pod and Queen. I missed one here. I also missed one in the Med Lab. And then we're going to have one additional Compromat. I think there's 12 for the start locations. If you have additional Compromat, then you'll start to place them in the blue locations. At this point, it does not really matter where you place it. Um, so you can place it in any one you want to because no one has cards to make decisions yet. We'll put it in the security room. You can place it uh, anywhere you'd like to. Okay, so the Compromat is all in play. Um, you'll make sure the turn marker, which in TTS is going to start in the appropriate spot, uh, is next. We're also going to now look for uh, who's in command of this, uh, of this vessel. Um, which, interestingly enough, we've got a command token here next to the command actions. There, normally, it would go to um, uh, to the character that is lowest um, in command uh, with the chain of command symbol. So, if we look at some of these characters that weren't used, the counselor, for example, is number four. The commander is number one. Interestingly, our random thirteen characters. Uh, perhaps for the first time ever, don't have a single chain of command token. So when you're in that situation, you're actually going to use this token. If no major characters is in the chain of command, flip this and give it to the first human drawn. So we're going to flip it, and we're actually going to give it to the stowaway, and we're going to give command to the stowaway. So maybe all the crew on board have already evacuated and saved their own skins or something, and the stowaway somehow has finagled the command codes and is now in command of the station uh, in its final minutes. Um, the uh, jammers and cameras start in the on position. That's already done for you in the TTS mod. Um, there's three re-entry markers. So you'll notice that there's a bag here with three re-entry tokens in it. You'll randomize it and you'll just grab one and put it in the zero spot. Uh, you may recall that when you reach the zero spot, you'll flip this token, and if it says station fall, the game ends without taking this turn. If it says orbiting, then you actually get to play one additional turn uh, in your game. Uh, you're also going to take one random Project X. So there's a deck of Project X. There's eight Project Xs. We'll randomize that with the R key. We'll pull one, and we'll put it here. Uh, and if Project X is ever released, then you'll flip this, and if characters uh, can uh, gain the, the X secret token, then they can peek at that. All right, the map modifications has already been uh, accomplished. We also normally would be placing our lock tokens, but TTS does this for us automatically. Um, you'll notice that some sections start with this little green uh, lock um, icon, and you'll place the, the lock token uh, on there. Um, that's just where the initial locks start in the game. All right, now we have this identity deck that has 14 identities here. We're going to flip it down and we're going to randomize the moles and alien deck. So it indicates here this is the mole and alien identities. We'll randomize that. We're just going to take one, put it in the identity deck, and then randomize the identity deck. So now we have a deck of 15 identities, including everyone associated with the major characters, which are the random ones we picked at the beginning as well as a single uh, alien or mole card, um, which we'll, uh, I can describe in another video. Um, and that's the deck of identities that you're going to use to uh, deal out to the different players. So if we were playing a four-player game, we would deal two of these cards out to each player, which uh, can be accomplished by right-clicking and then going to the deal button and just clicking straight on deal. Uh, twice and so every player would now have two identities from these major characters and could start to make uh, their decision the first decision they make in the game which is decide whether which of their cards is going to be their bonus card and which is going to be their secret identity so that is uh, how you uh, set up station fall um, 
So going back to the map, uh, this is a map of the station. Super messy right now. We'll clean it up in the uh, uh, later art. But the basic orientation and design, you can see way up here in the top left with this uh, faux cover art, you can see that there's a central sort of hub around which two rings are spinning. And so the map down here has a central hub that goes straight up and down the, the, the spine of this thing. And then it has a yellow ring, the forward ring. And then it has a blue ring, the rear ring. So uh, blue ring sections are attached to other blue ring sections. So you can see like storage here is actually attached to rear life support here. It goes along this line here. Um, it's not attached to the chem lab, which is in a totally different ring. So blue attaches to blue and yellow attaches to yellow. It's not laid out very well, um, but uh, it, it'll get better over time. The um, There's two... Um, types of sections sort of in general there's gravity and no gravity which can be relevant for some movement in the game but if an area is circular um uh that means there's gravity there so the therapy garden the quarters these are places that are in the spinning ring and therefore have simulated gravity zero gravity spots are sort of square shaped so like this machine shop here is zero gravity the rear hub here is zero gravity um and those can be relevant for throwing items and stuff like that So um, there's lots of different characters. You're going to be one. You're going to be trying to accomplish your tasks um, and, and accomplish certain things. So how, how do you go about manipulating um, the board? You're going to do it using the currency in the game. Primar I should say primarily using the currency in the game, which are these cubes in front of you. They're called conspiracy cubes. And you're going to, during your turn, uh, here's the sequence of play, um, you will first decide whether to reveal, right? We talked about uh, deciding whether you're going to uh, reveal your conspiracy and gain um, your conspiracy power. You next decide whether you're going to suborn anybody. In other words, whether you're going to place one or more of your conspiracy cubes on a single NPC. An NPC is just a non-player character, which in this game means any character that has not been revealed to be another player. So um, Team Purple here could, uh, during the suborn phase, say, yes, I would like to place two cubes on the Daredevil. They could say, I want to place one cube on the Daredevil. They could say, I want to place four cubes on the Daredevil. But they could not suborn multiple characters in one turn. They couldn't say one cube on the Engineer and one cube on the Daredevil. You can only place uh, uh, cubes onto one character during your suborn phase of a given turn. The next decision they'll make is who to activate um, of, the, of their characters. Now, I say their characters. What does that mean? A character that is your conspirator. What does that mean? A conspirator is any character that you have cubes on and have at least tied for the most cubes on. So the daredevil here is pink's conspirator, not purple's. Pink could activate the daredevil. Uh, purple could not activate the daredevil. However, if pink's two cubes were down here, now the daredevil is a conspirator for both purple and pink. They both have cubes on, and they're at least tied for the most. So purple and pink, either of them, could activate the daredevil. So what does activation mean? All right. By activating a character, you will take your disc, and you will place it on the character. This is your activation disc. This disc, um, unlike your cubes, is going to end up bouncing around over the course of the game. You're going to, over the course of the game, be suborning presumably multiple characters, multiple people on board. You're going to try to convince or conspire with or be sneaky and uh, try to get them to do your bidding. You'll do that by placing your cubes on them. But your activation disc will move around. So let's say first turn you at suborn the daredevil, activate the daredevil. And then next turn you suborn the engineer and you activate the engineer. And then the next turn you suborn the digital assistant, activate the digital assistant. And then the next turn you go back and you activate the daredevil again or go back and activate the engineer again. Your disc is going to bounce around, but your cubes are going to stay there generally. So um, activating is how you actually get to do actions. When you place an activation disc on a character, once again, they have to be a conspirator of yours, you get to take 
uh, an action with that character. Additionally, if there was no disc on the card uh, at the beginning of your turn, then you can take two action, an additional action with them. So that would be two actions. So you could move the Daredevil twice or something by doing this. Or doing any of these other actions, which are in a list over here. Most of them are fairly self-explanatory. Move around, do something, um, throw something, stuff like that. Now, I will mention that when you activate a character, you also get an additional free pickup or drop. So if you place a disc on somebody to do an action or actions with them, you get a free pickup or drop. So uh, you can see the pickup drop action here, Oops, which needs to be reworded. And uh, you can pick up or drop something during your, during your move for free without it costing an action. Um, if, let's say, pink comes in on their turn and they throw a disc on here, you'll see that pink will only get one action. And they'll only get one action because there was already an activation disc on the Daredevil. So if there's a disc there already at the start of your turn, then you'll only get one action with that character. I'll mention that if purple, for their second turn, they've already suborned and already activated the Daredevil in turn one. If on turn two they want to stay here and activate the Daredevil again, they may do so. But they will only get one action because there was a disc on the card at the beginning of their turn. So the game, uh, the, the rules of the game will encourage players to have a diverse uh, group of characters that you can bounce around to to sort of uh, accomplish multiple stages of whatever task you're trying to do over the course of play. But of course, everybody's competing over um, over the uh, over the characters. Everyone's placing cubes on them. And sometimes you can overlap without too much issue, but um, well, you'll see during play that may not be the case. Now, after you've activated, uh, uh, you will then resolve any events, which I'll get to um, if you ever start any fires or do anything equally awful on board that might require a time disk. Uh, alternatively, you can basically pass your whole turn and uh, renegotiate, which just means you'll remove a cube from a character in play. So let's say you dumped four cubes on the Daredevil previously, but somebody uh, smashed the Daredevil over the head with a wrench in a closet somewhere. Um, you, during your turn, could, could pass your turn and return one of the cubes on the Daredevil. So if you overextend yourself, uh, you, can return, uh, you can return cubes. Now the um, um, that's it for the that's it for the sequence of play. Regarding the uh, regarding the actions, uh, I'll go through them briefly. Uh, you can move to an adjacent section. I'll note that there's brown dot dashed lines here. You need a special ability to be able to um, uh, to go through those. Those are vents, so you'll need the tunnel rat ability, which, for example, the astro chimp has. Um, you can pick up or drop an item. You can also give an item. Remember, you get a free pick up or drop, but not give um, during your turn uh, if you activate a, a character. Um, uncover Compromat. So let's talk about Compromat. So, um, and Andy, you should probably go ahead and build us an identity deck of the of the characters that are in play and sort out the Compromat, if you would. Um, Compromat is going to be these uh, these items um, that look like this, these little folders. And there's going to be one associated with each character that's on board. So this particular one, flip it, is for the troubleshooter. Now, we're not playing with the troubleshooter, so uh, I'm just using this one as an example. But the point is, is that there's going to be a counter that looks like this, like a little folder. Uh, for each of the characters on board. And they're going to be placed around the map. They're, they're going to be placed in different places, and you'll see where they go. Compromat can be picked up. That's not right. Can be uncovered um, do, by a character during your turn. But Compromat, unlike other items, uh, goes to your hand. So Compromat is actually not an item. It will go to your hand. So you can actually just press like one on it, and it'll go to your hand. And then you flip it over, you can see it's the troubleshooter. And compromat means compromising material. So in other words, you have some sort of secret, some sort of dirt on the troubleshooter that would allow you to do an action with the troubleshooter during your turn. So you would play this out of your hand, 
and do a single action with the troubleshooter without having to put cubes on them, without having to activate them, without having to do anything. And that's in addition to your regular turn. So Compromat can be very um, useful and powerful, and it's something that's going to be uh, spread all over the map and that uh, often early game um, actions are to go pick that sort of stuff up to give you more late game um, versatility, perhaps. But if you really, really need the troubleshooter, in this case, to go to do something, to, to, to activate your escape pod or to smash that medical robot or whatever, then you could play this during your turn and do a single action with the troubleshooter. It works a little bit differently when played on a player, but um, I'll, I'll describe that uh, later if it comes up. The um, uh, throw an item, you can throw items in this game, which just means move the item from your section to an adjacent section. The only other rule is you cannot throw spin words. So you'll see the rings um, are spinning in a particular direction. You cannot throw, for example, from the med lab here to the mainframe here, that spin word. Um, that's just because of physics. And you cannot uh, throw to the vents. And you also cannot throw through vents, that's true. All right, uh, copy data. So there's a special um, type of uh, uh, token in the game called data. And there's only one uh, set of, no, we'll have two sets of data because we have the digital assistant in the game. There'll be two sets of data in the game. One is the evidence. So this is um, video evidence and I don't know, cell phone, digital evidence of some sort that shows all the crimes that have happened on board uh, over the course of time and during the course of play. And there's also the digital assistant. So we actually have a character in the game who is data. They're not a uh, they're not a robot or a human that can walk around and do stuff. They have different abilities. Um, they are uh, can be manufactured here in the mainframe by a uh, uh, character that um, with the appropriate skill. I can't remember what it is. Hacker or command, which will get put which will get put out there. But the point is, is that you can pick up copies, you can make a copy of the digital assistant and then you can send it to other people. Um, you can send data uh, using the copy data action to any co-located character. So let's say uh, the consort got the evidence and the consort was next to the legal robot, they could just give a copy. So we create a brand new copy of the evidence that goes to the, the legal robot in that case. I'll also mention that if the jammers are ever turned off, there's jammers on board that start on, then you can send data to any character on board. Um, so any character that's not EVA and has not escaped. And we have also NDA data from the legal. Oh, group. and we'll we'll also oh, which I haven't um, which I haven't reshaped uh, yet, which I need to make that note. Um, That's a good point, Feeder. Okay. The NDA is just another special type of data in the game, um, which you can read about on the legal robot. All right. Uh, you can also attack characters. If you want to attack somebody, then the character you're using is going to have to have a weapon. Um, and you can see the rules about it here. But you can down a robot or an unhelmeted human. So helmets protect you from attack using a weapon. If somebody attacks you with a gun, though, the helmet's not going to help you. Um, and also humans are the only ones that receive benefits from, from helmets. Uh, jacking a character, same basic rules, same idea, except instead of downing the character, in other words, flipping their token over and uh, showing that they are severely injured, um, you can take an item of theirs. You can also, as an action, activate a section. Different sections have different sort of special rules associated with them, and there's going to be a lot of them and a lot of weird you know, stuff on board. Um, any section that has purple uh, uh, lettering in the name is going to have some sort of special rule associated with it or a special action that you can take there. And what you're going to want to do is just look for the, the right colored uh, box that's sort of off the station. So for the chem lab, it's yellow. So you're going to look in the yellow section. Hey, where's the chem lab? Oh, here it is. Okay. Special rule. Any gunfire here starts a fire and you can manufacture fire bombs, which you can also see with this fancy icon. So, um, that's the special thing about the chem lab. So there's lots of different um, section specific rules. I'm not going to go into those, um, but the station um, is a is a weird place. 
And um, if you or anyone have any questions about this, you can always send me a message directly on Discord or something during the course of play because I'm, I'm not going to be playing the game. I will just be trying to offer advice to any new players um, or answer questions from them. Uh, so that's activating section. If you have a weapon or a gun, you can also damage the section you're in. If you want to smash it up, you can. Um, you can use nano meds, which is a special item. Um, it looks like this. Um, to revive a, a downed human in your section. So if there's a human that you like, or maybe it's yourself and you want a, <laughs> someone to come help you out, they can bring nanomeds and use them on you. Um, performing a system action. So these are the system actions in the game down here. You can perform them if you're in command or if you're in the security station or the mainframe. The, um, uh, the system actions include turning off the cameras, uh, turning off the jammers. You can also put out a fire. And you can also um, move command to the next undown in the chain of command, or if none, any undown human. So um, uh, that's how that works. Uh, I'm not going to go into more detail on that. Um, perform a command action. So if you're on the, God, that still says command deck. It should say bridge. If you're on the bridge, um, you can do, and you have command or or can simulate command in some way. So for example, if you look at the hacker special ability on the stowaway, if the jammers are off, they can move and act as though they have command. Um, so if you get your hacker onto the bridge and the jammers are off, that hacker can do any of the things a commander could do. So they could trigger abandoned ship, which is useful if you or anybody else wants to survive. You could activate the self-destruct, which is useful if you don't want you or anyone else to survive. Uh, you could also uh, do the bypass, which will release the evil project on board. There's a random evil experiment on board, of which we've chosen. It's here. You don't get to see what it is until and unless you actually go to the cryo lab and take a peek at it. Um, but that can be released, and maybe it's something awful, or maybe it's something really, truly awful. Those are pretty much the only two options. Um, and uh, uh, well, we'll see. We'll see what happens if that if that happens. But that's what a command action is. Okay, you can also launch an adjacent pod. I talked about um, you can also uh, flush a body out in airlock uh, if that's something you're into. Uh, you can also delete uh, data if you're a PC. So another reminder, NPC just means any character that's not revealed as a player. A PC is any character that has revealed as a player. Um, if you have revealed yourself, you can delete data in your possession as an action. Uh, or you can do a wait, which will return your activation uh, token to your pool if you want to. So those are all the now. Um, this is a big. This is a big crazy place, right? This is very. It can be very daunting for um, for for new players. Okay, uh, in this uh, snippet of video, I just wanted to discuss the launching of pods. It's part of the game that's uh, important for characters that want to survive. However, I didn't cover it in the previous uh, teach that I was attempting in the game. Uh, pods, you can identify pods because they're shaped differently than, than other sections. So you can see here that sections that are circular are uh, ring sections, which usually they have gravity. Then there's sort of rectangular sections like the hubs here. Those do not have gravity. Then there's also pods, and pods are stars. So these sections back here are all pods, as well as any other pods that may have been placed on the game. In our particular game we've set up, we've uh, added the commander to the game. Um, and the commander uh, starts uh, in command. But also, because the commander is in the game, uh, there's a medical evac pod uh, uh, towards the front of the station. Now, the, uh, most of the pods in the game are reliable pods in the game. The pods that are always in every game are going to be at the rear of the station back here. So if you're interested in surviving, you're probably going to want to migrate down towards those, uh, those pods if you care about surviving yourself or if your bonus card has the little shields on it and you want that character to survive. So now, how do you actually escape and launch a pod? Well, step one, the station must be an abandoned ship. This is a status, and this status can be triggered during the course uh, during the course of the game. There's a number of ways for it to automatically trigger. One is if the antimatter is ever armed, then the station uh, uh, immediately goes into abandoned ship because it knows there's extreme danger. Two, if Project X is ever released, then um, uh, your your abandoned ship is automatically triggered. Three, if uh, the 
command action, soon to be renamed bridge action, um, uh, is ever taken, called abandoned ship, then the, the station immediately goes into abandoned ship. And you just place a marker on that. The last way is that the game automatically, the station automatically triggers abandoned ship when the beginning of turn zero one. So when there's basically one turn left, or maybe two, depending on the outcome of of, uh, of this orbital decay marker, then abandoned ship will also be triggered. Now, Peter's also pointing out that blackout also triggers abandoned ship, but it does incidentally too, because uh, Project X gets released in that situation. So it, uh, it does, that's another way that uh, Project X can be released and abandoned ship can be triggered. The um, once abandoned ship is triggered, first of all, you remove all locks. So re remember that locks are these black markers that block corridors, movement through these corridors. And pods may now be launched. That's the key language. So now there's opportunities for characters to uh, eject from the station in a little escape pod and make their way to the mesosphere over here, the safety of Earth's upper atmosphere. Okay. So how how does that happen? How do you get it done? Well. Um, there's two options, um, and there are two actions as described on the uh, action tokens here. And that is to either uh, immediately launch an adjacent pod or set a timer within a pod. So let's say you are the border and you want to escape and you've got the border suborned cube and um, you really want the border to live. Maybe the border is your bonus card or something. You could activate the border and have the border move into a pod for one action. And as the second action, set a timer within the pod. That just means place a time disc on the pod of your color. So if Team Brown is doing this, they'd place Brown on the, on the pod. Time discs, like all time discs in the game, will trigger at the end of your next turn. So that means Brown's turn's pretty much done here. All the other players in the game are going to get to do whatever they want to, which could involve all sorts of nefarious activities. Um, but then Brown's going to take another turn, and it's their turn next. And at the end of that turn, this pod will launch with whoever and whatever's on board. Um, I'll mention that if a damaged pod launches, so let's say someone threw a firebomb in there before the, uh, before the border launched and damaged and uh, lit a fire in there. Well, the border is fine from the fire due to having a, a helmet, so the fire is not an issue. However, the damage to the escape pod is mm, fatal to the border because when this pod launches, um, everything on board is destroyed. If a, pod, if a damaged pod launches, everything on board is destroyed. So unless somebody else popped in there and repaired that damage or something, this pod is toast, so the border may have to get out or something. All right, so setting a timer takes time, which is risky uh, by itself, but um, it can be done from within the pod, which is pretty useful. Now, let's say uh, Team Border um, instead is in a situation like this. Now, the uh, Border could activate themselves. They can move into a pod. And then if they wanted to, they could set a timer, but maybe they're afraid of, of uh, intervention. They may play their bribe or compromat on a on a character to do that launch immediately from an ad launch an adjacent pod immediately. So in this case, the legal robot is adjacent to the rear pods. You see these rear pod lines actually go behind the ring to the rear airlocks. All of the pods here are adjacent to the rear airlocks. That means anyone in the rear airlocks can launch an occupied pod instantly with an action. So uh, if this was the beginning of Brown's turn, he could bribe or do something or he could just suborn and activate the legal robot and use an action to launch this pod um, and launch another pod and launch someone else's pod or something like that so um if you're launching somebody else that's instantaneous however you're trying to launch yourself from within a pod that has a timer so that's the trade-off um that that players need to be aware of um there's other things i should mention these these escape pods are um normal pods and don't really have special rules associated with them but some of the pods in the game do have special rules and for example we have the inspector in our game so that means instead of an escape pod here he's actually parked his ship in one of these airlocks um this means that the the osha ship is one of our pods and ways to escape 
And the OSHA ship has special rules, which you can see here. It can only be launched by a character with jury rig or badge. So it's going to require a special ability to actually launch the, the OSHA pod. However, abandoned ship is not required to launch the pod. So you could do this on turn two if you finagled away for someone to get onto the OSHA ship and somebody else to come in and launch you who had badge, a badge or a jury rig, you could hotwire that uh, the, the inspector's ship um, and, and, and escape. And once again, any pod that launches is going to be moved to the mesosphere. I should say any undamaged pod that launches is going to be moved to the mesosphere. And um, uh, once you're in the mesosphere, you're basically out of play. You can't do anything else once you're there, um, but you will survive. The characters that go to the mesosphere who are not downed will survive. The other special pod that's noted here um, that's in our game because the commander's in the game is the medical evac pod. It's another special pod. You can read the rules here, but basically, once again, abandoned ship's not required. However, it can only be launched if there's a downed human within. So uh, if the uh, daredevil is downed and the botanist is here, you can activate the botanist, drag the daredevil into the escape pod, and then set the uh, and then set the timer if you wanted to. For example, even if there's no abandoned ship, uh, because you got a downed human in here, uh, that's what's required to actually activate the pod. Now maybe the maybe the botanist later drags the daredevil out and then climbs back into the pod. But once the timer is set, the pod will launch with whoever or whatever's inside. You cannot launch an empty pod instantly. So the legal robot couldn't launch escape pod Houdini with nobody in it. However, if you're setting a timer, once the timer goes off, whatever, whoever's inside um, is, is what gets launched. So I think that pretty much covers um, mm. escape via pod, at least uh, the pod escape actions. Now, there's other ways to survive in the game. Um, some of them are yeah, noted. You should uh, talk about the capacity of the pods. And uh, yes, uh, and that's a great point. the downed humans, uh, characters. Yes, so uh, Peter brings up a very good point. The pods have a specific uh, stacking limit, I guess. It, if it's got two little humans, that means two humans can fit on board. And I say humans, and that's the wrong term, because this is two humans or robots. Um, it, the OSHA ship can handle four people. Um, but the point is, is that a two human or robot characters is the max that can fit in a pod. So let's say the operative... Um, uh, drags the legal robot into a pod, the downed legal robot into a pod. The commander cannot move into this pod. This pod is full. It doesn't matter if you're up or down. You're going to take up a seat if you are a human uh, or a robot. Now, some many characters in the game are not humans or robots. So um, holograms, rats, uh, data, whatever else, those don't count. Just humans and robots take up a seat. And once the seat is occupied, um, you, you can't add any additional characters to it. Um, the other uh, methods of escaping include the uh, dive suit, as I mentioned, um, uh, is, is in the game because the daredevil's in the game in our particular setup. Um, a human or a robot that possesses the dive suit can move from EVA straight along this little blue arrow to the mesosphere. So you can, you can put on the dive suit and, and, and start to take off to the atmosphere and go... Uh, Try not to burn up on re-entry, but you will survive if you make that move. Once you're in the mesosphere, you're pretty much out of play and you're pretty much safe. So if the AstroChimp did this and the AstroChimp had the dive suit, then congratulations, Chimp. You are um, brave, a brave soul, but you uh, you survive. Um, the um, the other way uh, to... Well, there's, there's even more, but the, the other obvious one is this rescue ship. Um, due to the fact the border is in our particular setup, the rescue ship is coming. So that means that any, as it reads, undowned humans in EVA survive station fall. So if we get to station fall and the game would otherwise end and you're the chimp and you're just hanging out out here, or you're the commander and you're just hanging out out here with a reminder that chimps are 99% human and count as human in our game, um, these characters would survive station fall because they get picked up by the rescue ship. Now, um, if a player reveals as the border, so if they uh, if they uh, reveal themselves to be um, uh, the border, which they would do by putting this heavy brown marble on it, uh, then this flips, right? And so it, it turns out it was not a rescue ship; it's actually a pirate ship, and um, only the border can do can survive out here. 
uh, will get picked up. The pirate ship will let everybody else uh, tumble into the atmosphere and burn up and die. So um, uh, those are the primary methods of survival uh, in this game. Yeah. Usually uh, it's via pod, but there's, there's other ways to do it. I should talk about EVA. EVA is a uh, box here that just represents all the area outside of the station. You can access EVA through these little arrows. You see the little in and out arrow here for EVA. That means that it connects to this one. So the rear airlocks, you can go EVA out the rear airlocks. You can also go EVA out the forward airlocks. You can also go EVA out either of the life supports, which have little, uh, little out arrows and, and stuff like that. Um, you cannot go in these arrows if it doesn't have an in arrow. So you can go in the rear airlocks, but you can't go in the exhaust port on the rapidly spinning forward life support. That's too tricky. Um, but that's how you access EVA. EVA is a bad place to go. If you don't have a helmet and you're a human, it's got a hazard forever. It's also dark, so uh, there's no cameras out there if you're up to no good. Um, the one thing that's going to be important in this game about EVA is that because the border is in the game, there's a rescue ship coming. So there's some sort of ship approaching the station and undowned humans in EVA will survive station fall. So there's another way to survive other than the pods. Now I mention it because the borders in the game, some of the characters tweak the station somewhat. So there's not always a rescue ship coming. Oh, there's only a rescue ship coming because the borders in the game. There's only a medical evac pod because the commander is in the game. And there's only a heavily armored dive suit uh, because the uh, daredevils in the game. That's another way to escape the section without a pod is you go put on this crazy suit that allow you dive through the atmosphere and survive back on Earth. Uh, you, that would allow you to move through this little blue arrow here directly to the mesosphere, which is uh, the safety uh, of Earth's upper atmosphere. I will, I will mention the suspect and guilt rule. So... Um, if you murder a human in a lit section, so you'll see some sections are dark, like the rear airlocks is a big gray thing here. Um, the life support here is a big gray spot. The tanks is a big gray spot. Those are dark sections. But if you murder a human in a lit section while the cameras are on, and the cameras do start on the station, then you will become a suspect and we will take one of your player tokens and place it. So if Team Purple were to murder a human in a lit section while the cameras are on, in other words, follow all the directions that are in this little arrow here, we would place a purple token here in suspect, which doesn't do anything or mean anything for now. However, if after that action, any character sends the evidence to the authorities, which I'll describe momentarily, then you will move that token from suspect to guilty and guilty players cannot win in a six player game there's two winners so the top two scores will win um the uh but you will not be one of those two scores if you are guilty at the end of the game however if you send evidence or deliver evidence at the end of the game so if you survive and carry evidence off with you to the authorities then you will move from guilty back to suspect so in other words um uh, downing a human in a lit section while the cameras are on may have repercussions that are relevant to you. Now, some characters don't care about this. So, for example, the border um, does not care about guilt at station fall. And it'll say it in your, in your victory conditions. Does not care, uh, ignores guilt at station fall. But I'll also mention the fugitive, uh, uh, the fugitive ability on the border. It looks like it's the only character that has it that's in our game. Um, actions with or against the border will not trigger suspect status so the border who uh, murders a human in broad daylight uh you have plausible deniability you will not become a suspect if during your turn you had the border uh shoot somebody because uh they are uh an illegal entity that provides you some insulation from uh some plausible deniability from your uh from your evil ways so that's how the guilt uh thing works now I'll mention evidence is one of the is one of the uh, concepts in the game. The data, um, the data can be manufactured by any character that goes to the security station. I'll also mention these locks, these circles here 
are locked. So that means those corridors are locked. You cannot move through those. However, with uh, a system action, you can place, move, or remove a lock marker um, anywhere on the map. The um, uh, uh, I wanted to mention the evidence um, is, is data that you can pick up in the security station. Even though it's locked here, you can find other ways to get in there. Um, the the evidence is data can be sent to other characters, as I mentioned, using the copy evidence action. But there's a, an additional thing you can do from an array. And there's two arrays in the game. There's a rear array and a forward array. So this is like a big dish uh, uh, for laser communications or something. This allows you, a character in one of these places, allows them to beam data off the station. So you can take data that you possess and send it somewhere. And there's three places you can send it, and they're called off-sites. You can send it to the news, you can send it to the authorities, or you can send it back to the company. Those are um, the uh, three places that the, that the data can go. And different characters may care about the data going or not going to those particular places. But I'll just mention, if you send it to the cops, that that may trigger other players to be moved from suspect to guilty status, which may be relevant uh, if there's any murderous sorts uh, on board. But that, uh, that remains to be seen. The last thing I'll mention, since you guys are making your decisions, I want to talk about just some of the mm, sort of important items in the game that people care about. So different people care about these things. I'll just go through them from top to bottom on the station. The first one here is the loot. So if your character cares about the loot, it is here. It's in the suite. It's in the blue ring. If your character cares about the evidence, it's here in the security station. But you can copy it, and you can send it to other characters, and you can even send it off-site using an array. Um, if your character cares about the artifact, it's here in the physics lab. It's a unique item. If your character cares about the bio samples, you can manufacture them here in the bio lab, but also the rat possesses an integral copy of the of the bio samples. In other words, meaning the rat is a bio sample uh, effectively. If your character um, cares about the antimatter for some reason, that's here in magnetic containment, uh, which um, is uh, a, <laughs> a section near the reactor and it's all locked up and it's full of uh, it's full of gas but if you go in there um, and the antimatter is ever removed from magnetic containment it will arm and that means it's going to blow up in five turns and that may prematurely end the game or it might just blow up everything eva uh, every player has a bribe token in front of them um, of their particular color you can play that bribe token on a character during your turn to perform an action with that character so it's just like a compromat in many ways it can be used on any character however if you end the game and you haven't used your bribe that scores you a point also if you bribe a character let's say you bribe the consort that character may sc will score a point for every bribe that's not their own color on them. So if other players bribe you, let's say you bribe the commander, for example, uh, the commander is going to score a point for that bribe um, if it's a different color than, than what they place. So that's how bribes work. I just wanted to mention it. If you're ever in a situation where you really need to get something done that's real important um, to get that extra action, uh, bribery can often be the way to go. Cover. The, uh, the top right is your secret conspiracy limit. So of your, of your secret identity, that's how many cubes you are allowed to place out into, uh, into play. So everyone has eight cubes. And you can put more than your... Uh, let's say that you are the uh, medical robot. The medical robot has four cubes secret uh, uh, conspiracy limit. Well, let's say they put six cubes here or five cubes here. Um, oh, that's a bad example. Let's say they put five cubes here. 
This would mean they are one cube over, so they would lose one point at the end of the game. So you don't want to go over your conspiracy limit. You can. Um, you may want to set aside a turn or two to try to renegotiate to get some cubes back to your pool at the end of the game if you think you've got time to do that. Um, otherwise, you're going to lose one point for every cube over the conspiracy limit that you uh, that you put into place. I think that's probably a good idea um, to try to introduce um, the characters in this particular uh, in this particular game. Um, so I'll very quickly go through them. Uh, the digital assistant is an app, so is data. So copies of the digital assistant will be spread around. The digital assistant's very useful if you want to do system actions. So you'll see the system actions once again down here in the bottom left. They are cameras and jammers and stuff like that. So the digital assistant's a real helper. Um, if the digital assistant is a player, then they want robots to survive and escape with a copy of themselves so they can go uh, proliferate through the world. Um, if the bonus icon attaches to per, per offsite with a copy of the digital assistant, so uh, you'll score one point per offsite that gets a copy. The other important thing to know about um, uh, the digital assistant is that any character that possesses a copy of this data can move and act as though they have command. So the digital assistant sort of acts like command code. So if somebody has the digital assistant, they can go through any door. They can activate any section. They can print guns in the in the in the print shop, and they can activate self destruct. So it's a very powerful set of information for a character to have. All right, the next is the engineer. The engineer um, is afraid of all the horrors that have happened on board the station and wants to make sure that none of it survives to reach uh, Earth. So they really want the antimatter to explode before station fall on board. Um, they want no biosamples to escape. They don't want the artifact to escape. And they also don't want any humans to survive who might be infested or compromised or being uh, 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 mentally uh, overtaken. Uh, and the engineer doesn't care about guilt or their own survival, so uh, that's the engineer's story. All right, the telepathic rat is an item. So this is a character, once again, that's not a character that can walk around and, and pick stuff up and hit people with wrenches. The rat is an item. So in other words, the rat can be picked up by other players. And the rat, though, has a very powerful telepathy ability. Um, and they can perform actions with co-located unhelmeted humans. So any co-located unhelmeted human, the rat can make them do anything they want to, even suicidal. There's a general rule in the game that no character will directly commit suicide, so they won't, they won't throw themselves out in an airlock or something like that. However, under the influence of telepathy, they may. If the rat is a player, then they want to uh, uh, be in a section full of downed humans and robots uh also maybe the loot or the artifact and uh the whole thing on fire they want a a giant funeral pyre of uh, uh of cult delight or something drones are not a player they are a these are truly remote controlled drones they they do not act on their own but you can use system actions to act with any drone the drones are important because they're pretty they're pretty dangerous uh, there's a drone here in the physical physics lab, and there's a drone here in EVA, because they have they start with integral weapons, so they they are armed, um, and lots of people can use them remotely, so they're they're fairly dangerous. All right, so I've now dealt everyone two cards, and your first decision is going to be to pick one of these cards to be. And then the other card's going to be your bonus card. And I want to talk about bonus cards because I didn't mention them before. But you've got two identity cards. One is going to be your secret identity, which is who you are. And you're going to be pursuing the victory condition of that card. So once again, bottom left of that identity card will tell you what it is. So let's say I've got two cards here of characters who are not in our game. The troubleshooter and the cyborg test subject. If I were to... Um, uh, take these cards. My decision would be to make my test subject my secret identity or my troubleshooter my secret identity. The other card that I do not choose is going to become my bonus card. And we'll actually rotate that in your hand. So one thing you'll be making a decision about right now is whether 
which of these you want to rotate in your hand. And the one you rotate is going to be your bonus card. So what is a bonus card? Let's say I chose to be the cyborg test subject and my bonus card is my troubleshooter. So I rotated my bonus card. That means I'm trying to burn this whole place down to the ground, which means accomplish these victory conditions here. But also, uh, I also, for unknown reasons, care about the troubleshooter and I want the troubleshooter to survive. And I can tell that because the troubleshooter's bonus card or bonus icons in the bottom left of the card indicate little shields. You can look at what that means over here, but that means they're your friend. You kind of like this guy. You, you're rooting for this guy. You want him to survive. So um, that's, what the little, that's what the little shields mean. You want this person to survive, and you want to accomplish all of, your, uh, all of your tasks over here. So that's what that means. Now let's say you did the opposite. Let's say you wanted to be the troubleshooter and use the test subject as his bonus card. Well, is the test subject your buddy now, Mr. Troubleshooter? No, he's got the little target icons down here. That means he actually wants the test subject to be down at the time of station fall. So at the time the game ends. That means you don't want the test subject to just be on board somewhere, uh, happy as a clam, and then the whole station burns up. No, you want them to be murdered before the station burns up. You want them to already be down by the time the station hits the atmosphere. So you will score two points because there's two icons if the test subject is down at the time of station fall. So that's um, uh, that's it. That's how uh, that's how the bonus cards work. So that's going to be your first decision. It's, you're going to have two identity cards in your hand. You're going to rotate one of them to show that you uh, that that character is your bonus card. The first thing you'll decide during your turn is whether to reveal your secret identity, so you're not your bonus card. Then you'll decide whether to place a cube or more than one cube onto a single uh, character, uh, mm -hmm. any of these NPCs over here. Then you will activate one, and you'll take an action or do two actions with them. Common actions early in the game are to go uncover Compromat. These, these crazy tokens are can be very useful. Um, and they get snapped up fairly quickly. But if you've got more important things to do, then go do those more important uh, those more important things. Maybe it's to go pick something up that you care about, or go get some data that you care about, or go unlock a place that you care about, um, cool. or go murder somebody that you really don't care about or you really don't like, or something like that. Um, uh, so it's very hard for me to offer advice as to what to mm, generally do on your turn, but. The only advice I can provide is that Compromat tends to be pretty popular early in the game for players to try to reach with a character. And usually, um, you don't want to dump too many cubes out early on, but that's uh, that's not always the case. But but um, it depends on how many cubes you have to work with and how much you care about a character. One reliable character might be worth a lot more than, um, than uh, three unreliable characters. So... Um, So it, it is a possibility in the game that somebody else is controlling my secret identity? No, there's only one identity. Well, oh, yes, yes. It is possible that somebody could suborn, place cubes yeah. on you. So let's say I was this troubleshooter guy again. Uh, Team Purple could drop two cubes on me and go do stuff with my guy. However, right. if, uh, if you were to reveal as that character, then these cubes go to a betrayal box, which is a, a place where cubes go to die. And um, and you will gain full control over your character. So if your character's doing stuff that you don't want them to do, then you may need to reveal sooner than later. Or you can suborn your own character. I'll, I'll mention this because you can suborn any character in the game. You can also suborn yourself. If you reveal as yourself, once again, if I'm the troubleshooter here and I'm Team Purple, maybe I'll suborn myself and go do stuff with, with my own guy that I want to do. And then later I'll reveal, which will just take the big ugly marble and put it on you. You'll actually get these cubes back of your own color. How does the game end? How does Station Fall end? Well, the station is on a collision course with Earth's atmosphere. So there's a timer. So after, what, 14 turns approximately, the, um, the station is going to enter the atmosphere and anything left on board is going to be destroyed. That is called Station Fall. Now, when does station fall occur? Well, there's two possibilities. It might happen when the turn marker moves from turn one 
to turn zero. Okay, and when that happens, you would flip this orbital decay marker and take a look at it. Now this one says orbiting. There's three total tokens. So you pick one random at the beginning uh, during setup. Um, the other two say station fall. So there's one in three chance that your game will continue for one additional turn. If it was not orbiting, if instead it said station fall here, then the game would end immediately. Otherwise, you would play one additional turn, and then when the turn marker would move to this giant fireball, you would end the game and proceed to scoring. Now, there's another way that the game can end, and that's if the antimatter is armed and detonates on board the station. So whenever the antimatter is armed, which can be armed by leaving magnetic containment or somebody activating the self-destruct mechanism or one of the Project Xs can get it done, uh, the antimatter will be on a five-turn timer approximately. And so uh, if at the time that that time runs out, the antimatter is anywhere on board, remembering that on board means not EVA and not escaped, um, then the game will immediately end and, and will proceed to scoring. So uh, if the antimatter is EVA, then instead of ending the game, you damage every section that has a, a airlock that comes in or out, uh, and you play on. The antimatter is removed, and you play on. With the additional uh, side effect that any items or characters that are EVA with the antimatter when it goes off are eliminated and removed from the game. Um, the uh, antimatter could also be in a pod. Uh, so th theoretically, you could imagine armed antimatter uh, being thrown into an escape pod as it's launching. Uh, if this happens, then uh, this escape pod and anyone and anything on board is removed from play. So it completely incinerated and wiped out. When the game ends, there's um, a series of things that you're going to need to do in order to calculate your individual scores. The uh, first thing that you need to remember is that not every player is perhaps revealed by this time. You remember at the beginning of every player's turn, they have a decision to make as to whether they're going to re reveal their secret identity. Um, but there may well be players who have played the entire game and have not revealed their identities. Um, if there are such players, then now in player order, the first thing you do in player order uh, is each of those players will reveal their identities and execute any on reveal abilities. And this can change the game state at the very last second. I mean, if you've been uh, sneaky enough to uh, keep your, uh, your identity hidden from the other players, then you may be able to, to modify the game to your advantage. So, for example, we've got uh, two players here. This is Team Purple and this is Team Yellow. Uh, it looks like uh, Team Yellow has not revealed their identity yet. Um, Team Purple uh, has revealed their identity. Now, Team Purple uh, would not, therefore, get their 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 conspiracy power because they're they're already revealed. They wouldn't get their on reveal, get to perform a free action with each clone. That would have been really useful for the clones, as you can see on a current board state. Clone Beta would have been able to launch Clone Alpha using the uh, Health Inspector's ship. Um, then we would have had a surviving clone had the clones been unrevealed up until now. But we're going to take a look at uh, Team Yellow. Team Yellow is the Inspector. Also having uh, a conspiracy power that has an upon reveal activation. And that says regain your bribes counter if it's been used. And indeed, Team Yellow has bribed the clones during the course of the game. So the investigator will actually get to pull back their bribe token from uh, the clones. So um, that would uh, that's how the on reveal works. If there's any players that have not revealed, then in player order, they will reveal. And if their conspiracy power says on reveal, do this, on reveal, do that, then you need to do those things before you proceed to scoring. That's the first. That's the first step. Now, uh, also, any surviving uh, player characters, and in this case, I only see one surviving player character, which is the inspector. The any surviving player character that possesses data of any sort can decide in player order once again to copy their data to other uh, offsites. So uh, the three offsites that are still in the game, 
uh, the inspector could say, uh, send the data to, uh, for example, it looks like the authorities, right? The inspector scores some points for the authorities. So maybe he would send a copy to the, to the authorities. This would be when you do it before, uh, before scoring. I'll also mention that in the new uh, suspect and guilt rules, which has a placard in the TTS mod, this is a slightly old game that we booted up here, but there's a placard in the upper right uh, of the TTS mod. Any player that delivers evidence at the end of the game moves their status from guilt to suspect. Okay, You do not move anybody else up to guilt, but you would move yourself down uh, if you assist the authorities at the end of the game by giving them uh, the evidence. The next part of scoring is going to be actually trying to calculate how many how many points uh, you get. So the, the first thing that each player is going to do is take a look at the victory conditions in the bottom left of their particular secret identity card. Not their bonus card, their secret identity card. And they're going to see what points they score from that. So in this particular case, uh, still looking at Team Yellow and Team Purple, which are the Inspector and the Clones, respectively, the Inspector survived. Congratulations, Inspector. Uh, does he have the loot? If we look at the Inspector, indeed, he's got the loot. So there's an additional four points for having the loot. You'll notice that plus four victory points on the Inspector card. Anytime you see a plus in the victory column, that's a that means that you must accomplish the predicate victory condition first. So in other words, if the inspector has the loot but does not survive, that's worth a grand total of zero points for uh, for that part of his victory conditions. If you see a plus, that means you have to do the previous thing first. Also, it'll note, uh, looks like the inspector scored six from that. Also, the authorities got the evidence and the inspector cleverly decided not to give it to the company or the news. So he's going to score a bunch more points. He's going to score a total of three more points for that. Um, so that's how many points uh, he would get. Six plus three is nine points. A very healthy score just from his, uh, just from his uh, the victory conditions listed on his secret identity. But there's more, uh, there's more points that we have to calculate. The next thing you're going to look at is your bonus card. So uh, your bonus card, in this case, the inspector has the botanist. Um, and you're going to look to see whether the bonus is a grudge or whether it's a friend, remembering that these little uh, target icons uh, mean that you want that character to already be down at the time of station fall. So in other words, um, if they're just hanging around on the station, that's not good enough. You need them to already have gotten uh, clubbed with a wrench or something somewhere um, or otherwise downed to score these two points. And indeed, it looks like the botanist is EVA um, uh, or at least their body's EVA. Maybe got dra dragged outside. But regardless, the botanist is 100% down and this is a grudge. So there's an additional two victory points. For the maintenance clones, they've got the rat, but they have their friends with the rat uh, that means they want the rat to survive. The rat is in the possession of the Astro Chimp. The Astro Chimp is in an escape pod, but uh, assuming we've reached station fall, this pod and anyone in it does not survive because they have not successfully launched from the station. Um, th this would score the clones uh, zero bonus points. Uh, from their base victory conditions, uh, it looks like they would score none because no clones survived. Um, and uh, even if even if a clone had survived, the authorities and the news don't both possess the evidence. So it's a grand total of zero so far for the uh, for Team Purple. Not not a great showing. All right, the next thing you'll look at is whether you still possess an unused bribe. So in this case, Yellow does. They had used their bribe, but their special uh, conspiracy ability got them their bribe back. You get one point for having an unused bribe of your color in your possession. So there's an additional point. Uh, for the inspector, bringing his total up to 12 by my calculations. Uh, Team Purple also has an unused bribe. And so they um, they will score one point uh, for that, putting them finally uh, on the board. Next, you will score one point for any bribe on your character card that is not of your color. Okay, not of your color. So the inspector has no bribes, so no bonus points. The maintenance clones have two bribes on them, so they score two more points, bringing them up to three. These these bribes are not 
their color. Now, imagine if if it was a circumstance where, say, Team Purple had bribed their character before they had revealed, they would not get a point for this. Okay? No points for bribes of your own color on, on your own character. Once again, you're going to look for your PC and whether there's any bribes that are not your color, and you get one point for each of those. Now, the inspector would have actually gotten double points for bribes on his card. He didn't get bribes, so it doesn't come into play here, but if he did, it would have been worth two points per bribe instead of one. So those are how you score points in Station Fall, but um, you will also lose points in Station Fall in certain circumstances. That has to do with your conspiracy limit. So remember, your secret identity is going to determine your conspiracy limit. Okay, top right of your card has the icon. That's how many cubes you can have in play at the end of the game and not get a penalty. You will get a minus one victory point penalty for every cube over that that you are. Now, um, I can tell pretty much uh, very quickly that the inspector is one cube over because the default is eight cubes. He's only got three left in his pool. That means that out there in the universe, there's five cubes. And indeed, there's I see three in the betrayal box and two over here on the counselor. He's got one cube over, which will drop his score uh, by one. Um, the maintenance clones, meanwhile, they've got four cubes left here, which means they should only have four out there in play. And indeed, they do. One on security and three in betrayal. They have not gone over, and they take no penalty. So uh, once you've added all those up, you will uh, compare scores. Remember also that in six players or higher, there can be two or even three victory victors uh, in, an, in a nine-player game. Um, and uh, also remember that if you're guilty at the end of a game, you will not qualify for, uh, for winning the game. And once again, you're going you're gonna to want to look at the guilt track at the, at the top in, in the newest version of the TTS mod. Uh, for that. Those are two things to uh, pay attention to. Um, the final uh, thing I want to mention is the tiebreaker. The tiebreaker. So let's say, um, you know, miracles happen. The, the clone launched this one and something went wrong with the inspector's bribes or something else, or maybe the, the clones got bribed even more. And they were they had a tie score at the end of the game. And only one of them was going to get to win. Well, how do you determine uh, who actually wins the game? The first thing you'll look at is who's got the fewest cubes in Betrayal. So between yellow and purple, who's got the fewest cubes in Betrayal? That's the first tiebreaker. In this particular case, there's three yellow and three purple. So they're tied for that. So you got to go to the second tiebreaker. The second tiebreaker is most cubes in your unused pool so of the tied players the most cubes in their unused pool in this particular case the maintenance clones would win the tie break on the second tie break by having used slightly less uh, of their um, uh, conspiracy uh, currency in the game and uh, would claim the victory so uh, that's how uh, game of station fall ends and that's how you count up your scores you'll look at your yeah. secret identities plus your bonus card points, plus unused bribes, plus bribes of yourself, and subtract any uh, amount of cubes that you've gone over your conspiracy limit. So this is Station Fall, 